Welcome back to some new r slash malicious compliance stories, where people comply to the letter, but not the spirit of our request. I hope you had a great day. Thanks for all the likes and comments on the last video. And now let's start with the first story. It's called Each and Every Received. We had a new office admin start in the expenses department who decided that all the rules were to be followed to the letter. And if it made it inconvenient for people to claim expenses back, so much the better. It would make her department look far more efficient, reducing costs and all. At the time I was working in a group of four people, going out to fix things in remote places. We had one company a Land Rover, which two guys went in. Another guy used his own van and claimed for the diesel. And I used my own old Range Rover, which was ridiculously suitable for getting out into the trackless wastes. The guys in the company Land Rover just used the company fuel card and the other two of us claimed our mileage. But then I got my mileage back with a note saying that in the future they would not accept the claim without every fuel receipt for the month being attached in full. No copies, no partial receipts and definitely enough fuel indicated on the receipts to cover the distance claimed for. Right then, it's like that, is it? My old Range Rover is big, it's heavy. It has a ridiculous engine, so it can drag trailers up mountains easily. And it gets through a lot of gas, not gasoline. This is Scotland, we call that petrol. I only ever put about a gallon or two of petrol in a month, just enough to get the engine started and warmed up. Like a lot of older vehicles with big thirsty engines, it's converted to run on propane. There's a big tank in the back where the spare wheel would go, a bit of extra plumbing and a special controller to adapt the fuel injection system to cope. With gas being about half the price of petrol, it made a lot of economic sense, especially when I was claiming for anything up to 2000 miles of travel a month. That is a lot of propane. That's filling the tank about 10 times a month and they want a receipt for every fill up. I started fueling up at the local Kaylor gas depot making sure I got them to print me off a full receipt for it. Each receipt was three pages of the pink copy of tractor feed duplicate paper. Watts and watts of bright pink tractor paper for every claim. The policy lasted three months. Then they decided they only needed the first receipt for the month, as long as it had a VAT number on it. A week after they changed the policy, Kayla stopped doing auto gas. So I had to start getting normal receipts from the supermarket filling station instead. The next story is called Working Hours. I was the manager and the malicious compliance person was one of the guys on my team. This was over 10 years ago and we were working at a software technology startup. It was a small company with only around 10 employees and I led the software engineering team of around 4 employees. We hired a software engineer and he seemed good but there were a few red flags. We would go out to lunch and he would always order at least a few beers. We didn't have any explicit rules against drinking alcohol during lunch, so I just let it slide, since it didn't seem to affect his work in the afternoon. And then the guy started disappearing early in the afternoon. Hours were somewhat flexible, but most people would get into the office at around 9am or so and leave at around 5pm or so. For a standard 40 hour work week, taking time off for lunch, it seemed relatively normal for most people and we had never had a problem with work hours in the past. But this guy would usually disappear at around 3 or 4 in the afternoon and was coming in at around 9 or 10 am. I'm actually not really a stickler when it comes to enforcement of work hours and I believe that as long as you get your work done, you should be okay. But as a startup, there was always stuff to do and there was always a backlog of things to develop etc. As a small team we didn't have much redundancy, so guys would have questions for each other throughout the day etc. It really did stand out as well, because since there were only 10 people in the company, the office space was pretty small and his absence was noticed by the CEO and other employees etc. I asked him about his frequent early departures and he just said that he had personal things to take care of sometimes. I told him that it's all good and while we aren't tracking time by the minute or anything like that, we generally expect people to work roughly 40 hours per week and hopefully that's not too unreasonable. I suggested that maybe if he has an appointment and needs to leave early, 
You can also choose to come in an hour earlier on that day. Or you can choose to work a little later on another day. To roughly make it up, he made some comments about how he's never worked at a company so strict before when it comes to work hours and that all of the other places where he worked never had an issue, etc. And sure enough, the next day, when I came into the office, I was told that when the office manager came to unlock and open the office, that the guy had been waiting at the front door since 4am, sitting there in the staircase, because he was told that he needs to come in early if he's going to leave early. And since he was planning to leave at lunch, he came in 5 hours early. He gave notice shortly after that, saying how unreasonable and strict we are, and he was gone a few weeks later. The third story is called His Last Power Trip. This happened several years ago. At the time I was working for a certain government organization. I worked office hours, which meant that our work hours were set. Our workday would start at 7.30 in the morning and then continue until 4 in the afternoon. In between we were allowed a 15 minute tea break from 10 to 10.15. 10 lunch from 12.30 to 1 p.m. and then a 15 minute coffee break from 3 p.m. Besides lunch, none of us ever worried about the tea and coffee breaks. We would get up from our desks and make a cup of tea or coffee and then drink that in between work. During lunch our offices would be closed to the public, which was the norm. But some officers who did critical work would have at least one person there during lunch for emergencies. Those officers would remain open and the members would take lunch at different times to accommodate the public. Although we were supposed to stay until 4 pm, none of us ever did. Most of us would go and sign off from 3.45 pm and then go home. We figured that no one would mind, since we never took our tea and coffee breaks. Then we got a new boss. For the first two weeks nothing happened and then we were ordered to stay until 4 pm. No more going home 15 minutes early. At first we tried to fight it, stating that we never took our breaks as we should, but that was shut down very fast. So we decided that we were going to follow the rules, no matter what. At 10 all the offices would close for tea break, no exceptions. The same would happen at lunch and again for the coffee break. At exactly 4 pm we would all close our offices and leave. Any one of the public still there? Sorry, come back tomorrow. Any one of the public there during our breaks? Sorry, we can only help after our break. Needless to say, everything that was running like a well lubricated clock very soon started to fall apart. People started to complain. And if there is one thing in the government that is not tolerated, it is complaints from the public. Sabotage? No, we are only following the rules as we should. I am not sure who got ripped a new one from upper management, but things very quickly returned to normal after a week of utter chaos and our new boss never dared to power trip again after that. The next story is called How to do the job. Two years ago, after putting hardwood in our foyer and dining room, we decided on a particular baseboard that Lowe's carried in pro packs. These packs come with six boards and I believe cost around 180 each. We purchased two packs, knowing that one wasn't enough, but we should have four boards left over, which we could then return. Due to a few miscuts, first time do it yourself, we ended up having three full boards to return, which I lucked back with my receipt. I brought them to the return area. And the lady who helped me was very unpleasant. As she took my receipt, I explained that these were free boards from one of the pro packs on the receipt and that the refund should be half of the cost of Ron, which is what the person who sold me the packs originally told me would happen. She asked me if I bought one of the boards on another receipt and I repeated that all three boards were part of a pack, that there was no other receipt and that the refund should only be half of one of the listed items. She said, don't tell me how to do my job and then walked back in the area to talk to another lady, also working returns. Two minutes later she came back and asked for my credit card. After putting a refund for $360 on my card, she also gave me a low store gift card with $180 on it because I didn't have the receipt for the third board I was returning. I was going to mention that I should have only gotten a $90 refund on my card and no gift card. But I didn't want to tell her how to do her job, so I left, went back a few weeks later and used the gift card for 5 gallons of paint 
which we use to paint the same room. The fifth story is called Best for the Team. This happened last year. I was one week away from my due date and was working full time in a school administration position. At this time I had the capability to work from home if needed. When I accepted the position, prior to my pregnancy, I was told by my boss, let's call her Ronnie, that I was very flexible as long as I got my hours in. I very rarely worked from home and typically only did so for an hour or two in the morning, if it was needed later on in order to work before appointments, as it was a long commute between work and home and the doctor's office. However, I was told by Ronnie after accepting the position to try and limit working from home to two days a month, which is fine. At this point I was well under, since I was only working an hour or two, maybe twice a month and only once a month before that. Being so close to my due date, I was experiencing physical hardships that made working on site more and more difficult. I was also scared of potentially going into labor while at work, with it being so far away from the hospital. To top it all off, my coworkers started asking more invasive questions about my pregnancy that made me uncomfortable. All in all, it was not a fun time. I explained all of this in an email to Ronnie and ask for her permission to almost exclusively work from home up until I go into labor. I said I thought it would be a reasonable accommodation and I work really well from home. Ronnie responded a couple of days later, denying my request to work from home at all and said I needed to be there since we would be starting some of our busiest work in a couple months, which I would be gone for on maternity leave anyways, so I'm not sure why she brought it up. But I could talk to HR about leave options if I am truly having trouble working. It is illegal in my state to require an employee to take leave if there is a reasonable accommodation that can be made instead. Q malicious compliance. I immediately went to HR and did just that. We talked our options and found out I could start my leave the very next day and still be paid state mandatory leave pay for the extra time. I informed Ronnie that I would be out starting the next day as I needed to take care of myself. She said, I understand you need to do what's best for you, but you need to understand that I need to do what's best for the team. Everything I normally manage basically went to crap in my absence as the other people on the team weren't qualified to do the work and kept taking time off leading up to my due date instead of learning the basics while I was still there to teach them. I left detailed procedure notes and workflow lists, but I later found out Ronnie had to pick up all the extra work and a lot of it never got done since she didn't have time, but it was best for the team, right? The last story is called No Fence. About 5 or 6 years ago I built a fence in my backyard. I talked to my neighbors and we decided on a good place to build the fence. We knew an approximate property line based on some survey pins but we were both too cheap to pay for a surveyor. We shook hands and I built the fence. It was a great deal for my neighbors. I paid for everything, built the fence and all they had to do was give me a thumbs up when it was done. Then a year later they sold their house. That meant I got a new neighbor. More specifically I got Anne. Anne was from the big city. Anne was a realtor. Anne had flipped 8 houses in 12 years. Anne loved this new house and planned on staying for a long time. And Anne had a dog. Crazy was a German Shepherd mix. It spent most of the day outside while Anne went to work. Crazy was aggressive towards everything. Crazy also, as Anne once told me, loved to chew on furniture. That's why Racy stayed outside so much. About 6 months after Anne moved in, I saw a surveyor walking around in my neighborhood and he was paying special attention to my backyard. The next day Anne showed up at my front door with a stack of papers and asked me if I was going to pay her for the 9 inches that my fence was encroaching onto her property. I explained the handshake deal with the last neighbor but she was having no part of it. She wanted the fence moved or she wanted money. No discussions. She had spoken to her lawyer friend and was perfectly happy to take me to court over the fence. She told me, I don't know how you guys do it out here in the sticks, but where I come from we follow the rules. So I got rid of the fence. The next day I unscrewed the horizontal rails from the brackets, stacked the fence panels up against my garage and pulled up the fence posts with my workman. About a week later 
and shows up at my front door again. She wants to know when I'm going to be building a new fence. Turns out, without my portion of the fence, she has not been able to let Rezzy out unintended, for fear that he will run away, attack something or get hit by a car. She also told me she can't keep him in the house all day, or she's at work anymore. Her furniture and carpet are all but ruined. I told her, well Anne, I'm not going to be rebuilding the fence. I don't want any legal trouble. And the best way to stay out of trouble is not to build near your property. The look on her face was priceless. I thought she was going to cry. She probably did when she got back home. She tried to protest, saying that she really needed the fence back and she would even help pay for the new one. She told me how much she loved the style and aesthetic of the old one. It was just the location that she had a problem with. I stood firm. There would be no new fence. She never got a fence. She made half-hearted attempts to put up some bamboo fencing, but Razy tore through that stuff like red newspaper. Eventually I sold my place and moved away. I took the old fence panels with me and I still look at them every day when I let my dog out in the morning. Thanks for watching the video to the end. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe. And if you have time, watch another one of my videos. Also, if you want to support me further, check out the channel membership or Patreon. And now I hope you have a great day. See you soon. Bye bye.